From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. This is our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccan, who is with us as always backstage. You are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know live at the Theater 80 St. Mark's. Oh, oh yeah. And it is a very special day for me personally. Uh, just really quickly before we get into this, gentlemen. You got this, dude. Uh, 17 years ago today, a little over that, I met this girl at the International Thespian Conference. And uh, we, we hit it off. We, we were introduced that day. And then 10 years ago today, I got to become her husband, which is kind of cool. And uh, she's here, and I never get to uh, <laughs> do the show in front of her. So a uh, happy anniversary, Diana. Yay! Yay! Happy anniversary! Start Happy the night anniversary. off on a heartwarming note. I love it. And this this is a special day. This is a special place with so much history. So we we three said we've got to have a special guest, and luckily we found the perfect one. We'd like to introduce you. I think we all know and love her, the co-host of the award-winning podcast "Stuff You Missed in History Class." Holly Fry. Holly. Holly. Hello. You guys are way too sweet. And if you would like to just hang out at my house and do this every morning when I wake up, that would be. Um, so as Matt kind of did in a neener neener way earlier, we did get to see The Kitchen already, um, which is Warner Brothers' new film. And uh, as I think Scary explained, it follows these amazing women on their incredible trajectory through like taking over the crime industry of 1978 Hell's Kitchen. Um, this in turn, no spoilers, because we don't want to give any of them away, but because it is a story about women in the crime syndicate, it inspired this podcast, which is uh, about another story of a similar incredibly badass woman uh, who worked her way to the top of the organized crime of New York and other places, as you'll hear. America's first mob boss was a woman, you guys. It's true. It's true. It's true. Specifically, a woman known as Frederica Marm Mandelbaum. She was born Frederica Henriette Augusta Weisner in 1818 in a Prussian town called Kassel, which is now a city in modern-day Germany. That's right. And we don't know a whole lot about Marm's backstory other than, uh, you know, she her family was Jewish. And in 1848, she married a guy named Wolf Israel Mandelbaum. Nice. And mm. Nice <laughs> with nice. the Wolf. Wolf. Man, Wolf Mandelbaum, mm -hmm. and uh, she, she and he were traveling peddlers, and they were subjected to some pretty serious persecution and anti-Semitism throughout their lives uh, when they were there. Yeah, uh, actually, traveling peddler was one of the few jobs that Jews were allowed to hold at the time. Right. Um, and in addition to this discrimination, the Mandelbaums were also really driven to a scary place, which is the brink of starvation, when the uh, the potato blight of the nineteen or the eighteen forties hit Europe. We talk about it a lot in context of Ireland, but uh, many countries were deeply impacted. Uh, and so there was also this political instability that developed in Germany in the late eighteen forties when they had their own series of revolutions, which failed. And these combined factors led them to the decision that they had to flee Germany, and they left in eighteen fifty. So Wolf uh, left on the steamship the Baltimore and arrived in New York in July of that same year. And Frederica and their infant daughter, Berta? Yeah, nice. Berta. Yeah. Yeah. Nailed it. A plus. pronunciation guru right here. Mm -hmm. Berta uh, soon followed, and uh, they arrived in September via the Erie. And Frederica at the time was 23 years old, which is bonkers to me. I don't know why, because I'm 35, and I don't feel like I've accomplished nearly as much as, as we're going to describe this woman having accomplished at that point in her life. But the Mandelbaums traveled in steerage, um, where more than 100 immigrants were packed into these incredibly tight quarters in one of three of the ship's lower decks. Um, and there was a row of tiny hay-lined bunks that were stacked against the wall um, and passengers were provided with what was called an immigrant's kit, which was a horse blanket, a beat up tin plate, a knife, a fork, and a spoon. 
and seasickness was rampant. It was a constant problem. And the remedies that folks used, things like lime drops, and yeah, uh, it's true, raw onions, uh, were totally useless. So personal space and hygiene were entirely non-existent. And diseases ran rampant on the ship, and many did not survive this absurdly perilous journey. Yeah, I feel like we should consider like... Mm. the the supplies they were given were not nice. So next time you're on your international flight and you want to complain about your thin <laughs> yeah. blanket, just trust that you're getting luxury by comparison. Yeah, about the, the happy Titanic moments you see in steerage, <laughs> untrue, <laughs> right? No, no. Total, untrue. total fantasy. And especially difficult for Marm because Marm was almost six feet tall. Uh, she was around 250 pounds. She was an imposing figure who stuck out in a crowd and she was... She was easy to find. So imagine being almost six feet tall and stuck in, as Noel said, these tiny hay-lined buildings, this serious, seriously dangerous, torturous situation uh, could prove fatal to a lot of people. And we will never know exactly what Marm and her daughter endured during this journey. But one thing is for certain, it was not pretty. It was the opposite. It was ugly. And the crowding did not stop at steerage. This is... This is one of the worst parts. So they get out of the boat and they think, you know, who knows what they're dreaming of? A big, beautiful city, green vistas and so on. But the problem is by 1850, this city, New York, was the largest and busiest port in the United States. So Frederica, her husband, Wolf, and Berta were just three of roughly two million people who would immigrate to the U.S. via New York during the 1850s, chasing this dream of a better life in a better country. And it was a dream that was tough to catch, especially early on. The, the, the Mandelbaum started their lives in New York in the lower east side of Manhattan in an area known as Klein Deutschland mm-hmm. or Little Germany, which we're, I believe we're in right now. We're at least extremely close to it at this moment. Yep. True. Um, at the time, Little Germany was made up of around 400 blocks and Tompkins Square Park, which is right down the road, was at the very center of it. And then over the years, it expanded pretty significantly. Um, and at one point, it was, I believe... Uh, well, we'll get into it a little later, but uh, like a lot of the German families who moved into the city around that time, the Mandelbaums began their life in New York, living with, with family members or friends who would put them up while they searched for their own place to start a new life. Yeah, and eventually the Mandelbaums found an apartment, their own place, on the on 8th Street. And it was a stifling, windowless room in an absurdly run-down tenement building. There was no heat. There was no indoor plumbing. The bathroom consisted of a wooden outhouse in the alley. And they had to carry their own water from, like, hand pumps. Um, and that was the only way they could get access to fresh water. And those hand pumps were out in the sidewalk. So probably a lot like your first apartment, of course. Um, <laughs> is what I'm guessing. And the thing is, life for most immigrants, uh, as much as they thought this was going to be way easier, it was extraordinarily difficult. The Mandelbaums actually lost their first child. That was not an uncommon occurrence for families. But even so, with that tragedy in their history, they still ended up kind of doing better than most. Um, they had a room to themselves, for example, which seemed incredibly luxurious. And a lot of immigrants were actually living transient lives. They were sleeping wherever they could where they could put down a bedroll, where someone would let them. They would just, if they could find a dry place, they would make that their bed for the night. Um, They carried literally everything they had with them. So... I mean, I couldn't even carry my Star Wars figures. But um, Have you been to the tour of Ellis Island where you see yeah. like, the luggage room where they confiscate your luggage and you get it back? We're talking like trunks. We're talking like these massive packs that they would carry everything they had and they would absolutely lose a lot of these things throughout the course of this experience we're talking about. They would, and part of that was that they were really victimized by slumlords who took advantage of people in this desperate situation who would you know, charge them way too much for not permanent living quarters, really tight. Uh, And often there were dozens of people crammed in one room. So then if they did not pay, they lost those possessions because those slumlords would kick them right out and they did not get to take their things with them. So at that point, they would just be turned out on the street. They had no money. They had no possessions, just the clothes on their backs. And they were trying to start a new life. So survival very quickly became the name of the game. And the system was, of course, corrupt. And the norm for immigrants was discrimination and cruelty. We've kind of hit that point repeatedly. Mm. And so, understandably, Mandelbaum, uh, like a lot of immigrants, just decided that she had 
to make her own rules and figure out a way to survive and support her family, and that meant turning to crime. And, as it turns out, she was phenomenally good at it. (laughs) Oh my goodness. She had a gift. No smoke on that one. So Mandelbaum began to lay the groundwork for her life as a career criminal while she was working as a street peddler. Since she and Wolf could not afford a wagon, much less a storefront, they set up shop on the streets of little Germany. They were walking in the midst of the crowds, selling whatever they could find that they thought anybody might remotely want. Broken watches, scraps of fabric, Not like whole pieces of clothing, like scraps of fabric, pieces of rope, stuff like that. And the kinds of things they were selling were, as you could tell, not in particularly high demand. So try as they might, working all day well into the night, they could barely afford to feed their children. Something had to be done. But it was during these early days peddling on the streets of Little Germany that Frederica Mandelbaum began making these contacts that would prove to be super important uh, in establishing her ultimately her criminal enterprise. So at the time, there were children that would just roam the streets. Uh, A lot of times they were homeless. A lot of times they were part of families that were transient as well. But they would sell these odds and ends, much like that peddler's life. uh, And their parents, if they had them, would encourage them to make a little more money to steal, uh, to do petty crimes, to become pickpockets and thieves. And Mandelbaum saw this, and she had like kind of a light bulb moment where she was like, okay, I'm going to capitalize on this. So she started literally like Oliver Twist, Fagan style, enlisting these street urchin children into this grassroots criminal empire. Um, She also met thieves and other petty crooks who, you know, like weren't children. Um, And she started to look into how to unload the stolen goods that they had acquired. And this led her to an aha moment where she realized, uh, hey, there is just as much, if not more money to make moving stolen goods than actually doing the stealing, uh, which is pretty enterprising. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and boy, oh boy, did she do just that. She found her niche and she was spectacular at it. So for the, uh, Mandelbaum and her family, things really took a turn for the better. This happened ironically during a time that was very difficult for most people because it was the panic of 1857. Yeah, not the most uh, encouraging way to describe uh, an event in history, right? So at the time, panic of the panic of 1857, we as a country, the United States, had more or less overplayed our financial hand. We expanded domestic uh, investment and business at a rate that lagged behind the already failing international economy, and it was a bubble that. Let me do a sound effect. It was a bubble that popped spectacularly. Oh, oh, that. Uh- There There we go. go. Nailed it. There we go. Number Uh, two was spectacular. Yeah, we'll edit that part. So, So it's serious, though. I don't want to make light of this. Multitudes of banks closed. Hundreds of businesses failed overnight. And that meant that tens of thousands of people woke up one morning without a job. And they had to figure out something. This was oddly advantageous for people who were already living on the other side of the law. They were familiar with this sort of informal system. The folks with legitimate jobs had to learn this stuff very quickly, and they had to go to the streets doing the same stuff that Mandelbaum started out doing. However, she was in a much better position. Oh, how the tables have turned. Mm -hmm. That's right. So... Mandelbaum had already established herself as this uh, shrewd trader, and she was a ruthless business person. And she was just in the perfect position to take full advantage of all the woes that the country, and specifically New York City, was going through at the time. And according to her contemporaries, um, when she was making a transaction, right, she would never buy anything for uh, more than half of what it was worth, and she would never sell it for less than twice of what she paid. That's pretty good if you can actually get away with that over the course of a career, right? Um, And she became known as one of the best fences in the entire city of New York. She was just purchasing stolen stuff from all the criminals that are gathering things for her and then selling it to legitimate buyers. Now, that can be anyone from just, uh, let's say, Holly wanted to get a Greedo, Mm -hmm. something or other. What? Are you Um, selling Greedos? She (laughs) she happened to have one. To a a business, a, a company that has a storefront that wants to have goods to sell there, right? And if you think about this, as a proprietor in these down times, in a down economy like that, 
The only way to actually keep your business alive is to offer the lowest possible prices to customers that you possibly can, right? Then uh, you also have to charge enough to make a profit on whatever good you're selling to them. And that meant that the stolen goods from Marm's Enterprise made business sense. And it makes you wonder just how many of Marm's fell off the wagon bits of loot actually ended up in legitimate storefronts in New York City at the time. Yeah, or how much of that kind of thing is actually still happening today, right, right, <laughs> right now. I mean... Don't it, think about it. Don't think about it. Uh, let's not. So that was way, way back in the mid-19th century. Uh, not now. Not, not now <laughs> at all, right? Sure. We're good. Everything's yeah. good. Um, Marm's network perfectly was straddling the worlds of both this this crime, the world of crime in the world of commerce, and she was connecting the numerous criminal sellers to the legitimate and very eager purchasers. And everyone in the city at that time is looking for a bargain in everything they're doing. And with Marm's business model, everybody was winning. Yeah, if you wanted to sell something to someone who was not going to ask a lot of questions, you went to Marm. And if you wanted to buy something on the cheap ridiculously cheap, questionably cheap, you went to Marm. So soon every street-level criminal had either met or worked with Frederica Marm Mandelbaum. But pretty quickly, her network climbed out uh, from just like the depths of street-level criminals, uh, and she started establishing relationships with people like lawyers, police officials, prosecutors, anyone that wanted to have a relationship that had something to gain from knowing Marm. She was a regular at this place called the 8th Street Thieves Exchange, which was one of New York's most active black markets. I heard it described as like a Walmart of thievery, kind of. And yeah. um, wards, by the way, at the time were these numbered voting districts in New York that was divided up into, uh, and that'll come up a little bit later. Um, so she was beloved as well in the Jewish community, and she often uh, used her synagogue, which was, she was very active in as a networking site. And and even the corrupt politicians of Tammany Hall, the political machine, were huge fans of Marm because they knew that if they played ball with her, that she would help them secure the Jewish vote in the 13th Ward, which she was becoming particularly um, influential within. So uh, there were folks like Tammany Hall's boss Tweed and the particularly corrupt Mayor Fernando Woods at the time who were regular guests at her house at these like soirees that she would throw and they absolutely were doing business with her no question about it yeah so while she's rubbing shoulders with all of these big names in the city She's also, she and all the money in her enterprise, they're financing some of the city's most spectacular crimes, like the Manhattan Savings Bank robbery. Which could be an episode all its own. It's crazy. But can you give us a, like a, a little quick and dirty about this? Definitely. So in, it was 1878 when this occurred, and this robbery was and still is to this day in 2019 the largest bank robbery of all time in terms of real money that was stolen. Uh, in, at that time, in 1878, over $3 million in cash money and securities were stolen. Think about that, in 1878 dollars. Whoa. So, they, but here's the big question. We've kind of gone over all this stuff about Friedrika Mandelbaum, but what really makes her different? How could she operate a criminal enterprise at this scale for such a long time? No. What I love about that is that's, that's a great question, and it actually does have an answer, which doesn't always happen when we're talking about history, right? True. So, so Marm succeeded in, a, in an industry that also had other players, right? There were rival fence operations. In addition to fighting against these groups, she raised four children, right? And she was caring for Wolf, her sick husband, and... Wolf suffered from consumption. He was also, sadly to say, not respected by either the legal operators like the cops or the illegal people. They, they all thought that this guy was a joke. They actually called him, and this was a very bad word at the time, they referred to him as a non-entity. Ouch. I know, it's brutal, it's right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so she was taking care of her family pretty much on her own. She was also running a legitimate dry goods store. And I, I want to I be honest with everyone. I want to clear this up really quickly because when we started working on this, I wasn't sure what dry goods meant. I thought it was like a bean store. Oh, like I thought the same beans. thing. Yeah, no question about it. <laughs> 
I honestly had no idea either. That's such a bless your heart moment. Thank you, Holly. Oh, Holly, as our resident, right. resident haberdasher or like yeah. in a fashion play, tell us what dry, dry well, it's goods usually, are. Dry goods were things that were non, non-food necessities. So it could be clothes, hats, tablewares, etc. Gloves, uh, maybe. Life needs. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. And so not beans. I want to really stress. Not, not beans. You can't not eat. dry beans. Just go to the grocery <laughs> yeah. store. Yeah, I, I got it, guys. I learned. So uh Marm also, while she was doing all this, while she was fighting rivals, raising her family, and running a actually legitimate business, she built the city's largest fencing operation, ran it for more than two decades, and still in history, in the history of this town, she is the most successful fence, even in 2019. But there's another thing that made her different. We've been throwing around the name Marm, right? It's her nickname. It's her street name. Where did it come from, though? Okay, so this is a fun story. Uh, Here's the deal. So she was a ruthless criminal mastermind, but she was also a very nurturing lady. Um, I mean, I think there's some evidence of that in the fact that she took care of a family while running two other businesses, Mm -hmm. one legitimate and one not. Oh, absolutely. Um, She actually took it upon herself to mentor young criminals. I mean, that's sweet. Um, (laughs) And when you think about it, she taught them their trade. So she called, this is the sweetest thing. She called her group of criminals her little chicks. Little chickies. And they called her marm in return. So it was a very nurturing and loving crime spree sort of area. Mother Um, hen kind of situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Beginning around the time of the panic of 1857, she started just taking various ne'er do wells under her wing. She was seeing lots of people who needed help, and she was like, "Come to me, I will, I will teach you." Uh, and although she helped criminals of all types pursue careers in crime and learn their trade and get really good at it, she was really, really particularly uh, soft-hearted and fond of working with young women because she felt like it saved them from a life as a housekeeper, um, or probably other options. Which and- is kind of a a framing spin. You know what I mean? Because right. these kids were helping her. Right. I mean, I also don't want to clean a house, but, <laughs> right. um, you know, pickpocketing sounds better. But uh, so uh, Chief, though, in her affection, even though she was very nurturing with her little chicks, really what it all came down to for her were her three surviving children. So Annie, Julius, and Sarah were the ones that lived after their first child had passed. And Marm was so dedicated to them that even in the middle of like an incredibly important deal or a meeting, if one of her kids was sick, she was like, I'm sorry, this deal can't happen now. I'm out. Um, Or even if they just needed her, she would completely call off whatever she was doing and run to their side. So things were really looking up for the Mandelbaums at this point. They absolutely were moving on up out of the tenements. And now Marm's home was full of uh, dry goods, but they were fancy dry goods. They were things like furniture, art. Art is the fanciest of dry goods, if you ask me. Silverware, draperies, uh, stolen from some of the best homes and businesses and mansions in New York City. Uh, By 1864, she bought a three-story building um, at 79 Clinton Street on the corner of Rivington and Clinton, and the family had their dry goods store still at the time, run by Wolf and the kids. It was an adorable family affair, Uh, but the real action was happening in the back rooms where Marm headed up this incredibly lucrative fencing operation. This isn't fencing like fencing. It's like yeah, yeah. moving stolen goods. I don't, I don't think anybody that. was confused. It's okay, <laughs> Holly. I was she, just clarifying. She might have sold fences. You don't know. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I so no, hope foils. there was somebody here this whole time going, I don't, how do you make yeah, money fencing? Yeah, like, just, fencing? I'm just, look, do you I'm jab just making, them and take their wallet? I'm I don't just making sure we're all on the same page. Like yeah. I see fences <laughs> everywhere around town, you know? It's What's true. Uh, and she was always one step ahead of the authorities in the event that there was a raid or something. Thing. She even had this thing, it was like a chimney with a fake back that hid a dumbwaiter. So if the cops were coming, they were knocking on the door, she could like load this dumbwaiter up in the fake chimney with all the stolen goods she had and lower it down underground and be like, what? I'm operating, yes. this is dry goods exclusively. <laughs> I am a legitimate business person. Leave me the hell alone. Are you a chimney inspector, sir? If yeah. not, be on your way. Exactly. You show me, show me your credentials. No, it's true. Um, so she was pretty crafty. There's there's a fantastic book by an author named J. North Conway, and in this book, he delineates three three principal reasons 
that Mar Mandelbaum was a cut above all of the other fencing operations. And, and the, I think they're pretty legitimate, to be honest. Well, the, the first one is, remember, she and her family, they're immigrants from Germany, right? They speak German. But she learned to speak English extremely well and pretty quickly, and she could function as an interpreter between any other immigrants who also spoke German and English. Now, this is huge because in 1870, there's an estimated 30% of all of New York City's inhabitants were either uh, German immigrants or their first generation children. So there are a lot of people that spoke both English and German or just English or just German, right? So a lot of her clientele would need this service and it probably also helped put them at ease when she's having a transaction with them, uh, if she can be function as a translator. And, and this is just my speculation, but I think it was probably advantageous that she could understand English so well if let's say she's having some kind of trade deal with someone who speaks English, who maybe doesn't know who she is and thinks that, oh, well, she probably only speaks German. She can understand everything that that person or that person in their, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. their others are saying. Absolutely gain the upper hand or even like overhear deals and, you know, all that kind of stuff and like totally figure out how to kind of capitalize on that language thing for sure. And, and feign ignorance too, right? Exactly. Like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. Literally. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the power to be the only person in the room who literally knows what's go everything that's going on. Um, second, she had this other skill set, which is sort of like a different kind of bilinguality, right? She <laughs> knew uh, the crime industry, but she also was running a legitimate dry goods store. So she knew the products that were available. And when things came in off the street, she knew what fabric was worth, what jewelry was worth, and she knew the markets for those products. So she had a very intimate understanding of both their prices and the level of demand based on the people that had been coming to her on the side with potential deals or needs. And this allowed her to make lightning quick calculations about the value of stolen goods when they were offered to her. Mm -hmm. And third, and perhaps this is the most important part of her operation, everyone from the judges to the to the street thieves knew that she would never ask any questions. You just show up with 87 hats? Fine. You know what I mean? Let's talk turkey. Uh, she dealt in plunder of all kinds. Silk, lace, diamonds, carriages, horses, gold, silver, of course, bonds, and more. And she could, like you were saying, Holly, she could just look at something a thief had brought her and then lightning quickly. She would know automatically how much she would pay for it and she would already know where she would sell it, which was brilliant. In fact, she was so she was so efficient at this. When the Chicago fire of 1871 occurred, looting was rampant in Chicago. It was pandemonium, it was chaotic. And a lot of the stuff that got looted from a different city ended up with her. It went through her hands at some point. And although her, although her pursuit of this stuff was sophisticated and very well thought out, the actual process was really simple. It's sort of like you said earlier, Matt. Uh, she, let, let's say, for instance, let's go with uh, 87 stolen fedoras. Sure. So somebody comes up, 87 stolen fedoras. Let's say that's like $100 worth of hats. It's like a math problem. We'll just, we don't know how much those actually cost. We're no Marv Mandelbaum. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. The yeah. values of hats. So she would say, okay, this is $100. If I were actually paying for this legitimately, I will give you $20. That's one fifth of it. And the thief would say, okay, yeah, that's fine. I'll just go get some more hats tomorrow. And then she would resell those goods for $60. And the police had action as well in this process. So the victims of theft might approach the police and say, hey, somebody stole all my weird hats or whatever. And they would say, well, if you make it worth our while, we'll do our best to find them. Well, and sometimes what they would do too is just go back to Marm and like buy another hat, like an equivalent hat, mm -hmm. and then say, hey, here's your hat. Yeah. And it was like, yeah, it was absolute subterfuge because they were getting paid under the table. So from their opinion, every, from their perspective, rather, everybody is winning except, you know, the, the victims. Right. <laughs> except the person whose hats those were originally. Um, what's interesting about Marm is that even though she became very successful and could have easily moved uptown to much fancier digs, she chose to stay in Little Germany. However, her empire expanded all over the place. Um, it moved throughout New York uh 
into all the boroughs, beyond the boroughs. Eventually, she became an established force in Trenton and Newark. Uh, she courted wealthy, legitimate clients, as well as Jersey criminals. Um, and then what's what's interesting and not really surprising is that her husband, Wolf, died in 1875. But because she had kind of been running everything, she was able to, you know, pretty quickly move on. She didn't have to pause and grieve and wonder how she was going to make ends meet. She was like, okay, well, let's keep the business running. And by the 1880s, she owned several tenement buildings. And uh, she also owned warehouses. And she used those warehouses to store all of this merchandise, uh, (laughs) all of the stolen goods that she was handling. But what's really cool, cool being a relative term, is that um, this is not all she built. No, and I love this part of the story. So Mandelbaum allegedly uh, founded an actual school to train up young criminals. Around 1870, she, it's true, she bought, she bought a <laughs> building on the corner of Clinton and Grant and transformed it into kind of like a, an X-Men school for the gifted or whatever, or a yeah. Hogwarts type situation. Uh, but instead of teaching you know young mutants or wizards or whatever to harness their super superpowers, uh, Mandelbaum's uh, Grand Street School started off with the finer points of pick, pickpocketry. Yeah. Pickpocketry. Pick yeah, there we go. I'm liking that. Or uh, things like misdirection. Um, and yeah, <laughs> young men and women alike, which is a big deal, um, were who showed promise with the basics were then graduated on to more advanced skills, stuff like safe cracking or grand larceny or blackmail uh, or con artistry, like you do. And um, the, the professors um, at this Grand Street School <laughs> were the best criminals in the city because they were already part of Mandelbaum's network of crooks. So students who excelled at this school uh, were brought into Mandelbaum's inner circle. Yeah, definitely a kind of promotion, right? Tap for, sure. for something greater. Yeah. <laughs> I still want to get my PhD in pickpocketology. I know, I right? Be I believe in you. PhD. Excellent use of my time. Your PhD, P, I guess? Sure, so sure. Yeah. So, oh, you know, allegedly this, uh, this school was right next to the police headquarters. Again, that's allegedly... She's so Maybe brazen. I, I love it. And I that, love her so much. That plays into the story because the thing about bribery and corruption is that there is a threshold. People will look the other way for some stuff, mm-hmm. but if we get too egregious, if we get too blatant, then there's a police chief who needs to get reelected, so needs a scapegoat. And although details on this details on this school are a little bit sketchy at this point, we know that it did eventually close when Mandelbaum found out that one of the students was the child of a police official. Uh, this kid was enrolled, and picture Mandelbaum, you know, just wiping her forehead a little bit and thinking, the heat's getting close, you know? Yeah. Uh, so, so she didn't want to risk the school being in Exposed, and part of it was probably because she had this loyalty to her little chicks, too. So it operated for about six years, and it generated, as you said, Noel, some of the most gifted criminals in New York, which makes them, by default, some of the most gifted criminals in the country at the time. Okay, so we've, we've established here that Frederica Mar Mandelbaum was a very important adult in the lives of a whole bunch of kids in New York City. Uh, and young adults. And to some, you know, she was the employer, the person that you take your goods to and you're going to get a little bit, you're going to get paid a little bit. To others, she's the headmaster at the school where you're going every day. And to a lot of them, she was also Ma, like we've kind of discussed earlier. And we actually have a quote here from Mar Mandelbaum. Oh, yeah. Uh, she's pretty blunt in explaining why they gave her this nickname. She says, I am Ma because I give them what a mother cannot sometimes give, money and horses and diamonds. And I don't know, I don't know how you guys grew up, right? but I had, a, I had a childhood lacking in at least diamonds and horses. You that's never even had like horseback riding lessons or like rode a pony or no, anything? No, but she's giving them their own horse. Oh, that's yeah, true. Diamond that's encrusted. A crazy. diamond yeah. encrusted horse. It's crazy. Uh, the money actually was coated with diamonds. It was just like <laughs> Christmas at my house growing up. <laughs> so we've, we've talked about some of those professors. Who, they were the, at the school. They were the, some of the best criminals in all of New York City. Uh, a lot of her protégés ended up becoming the next generation of best criminals. So we've got a few of those here that we'll, we'll go over. The first one is Sophie Lyons. And again, at a very young age, she started out working with Mar Mandelbaum, bringing things to her. And we actually have a quote from Sophie that illustrates the way she felt about Mar. She said, quote, I was not quite six years old when I stole my first pocketbook. That's crazy. I mean, you got to start them early. Uh, 
I was very happy because I was petted and rewarded. My wretched stepmother patted my curly head, gave me a bag of candy, and said I was a good girl. Ooh, foreshadowing. Right? Okay, so after years and years of stealing and conning, Sophie Lyons really did become one of the most notorious thieves in all of New York City. And she also became uh, extremely notorious as a confidence woman. And uh, she was considered by Marm to be one of her closest allies. Right. But as you might have guessed from the, the wretched stepmother line, uh, Lyons eventually turned on Mandelbaum and totally threw her under the bus. She actually wrote a tell-all book called Why Crime Doesn't Pay. Now, uh, yeah. Um, now, another one of the protégés who was also very close with Sophie Lyons was a woman named, uh, did we decide it was Lena? I think it's Lena. Lena. Holly for the win. Lena Kleinschmidt. And um, again, she's another very prominent criminal that came up under Marm's uh, tutelage. And she actually moved to Hackensack, New Jersey. And she was posing as the wealthy widow of this South, uh, South American mining tycoon. And she started doing the same things that Marm was doing, where she's holding these big parties for important officials. Only this time it's over in Jersey. And uh, she actually got in trouble because she was wearing a ring. This is how she got caught. She was wearing a ring that was stolen that was recognized by one of the important folks at her house. But at it a was party. a business model that Marm was yeah. establishing. This is like she, what? She like, was franchised. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a franchise. Yeah. Yeah. I like the idea that Lena was like the original faker of being the prince from Africa that <laughs> might need like and was getting confidence <laughs> of people that mm-hmm. way. It's nice. And these are just these are just a few of the associates. There were others that are very well known in crime history today. People like Little Annie Riley, Ellen Clegg, or Margaret Brown, who uh, went by the street name Old Mother Hubbard. Dope. Nice. Yeah, so uh, then we also had a guy named Herman Stout. Stout? Stout. Stout. I think yeah. it's Stout. Uh, and he was the only one Marm trusted. Uh, Stout was Mandelbaum's most trusted associate and was always by her side. He literally is the one who did all the heavy lifting, and when they did deals, he would tote all of the goods to one of her many warehouses across town. And she loved him over all of her associates, for sure. Yeah, she referred to him at different times as her son, especially when they were talking to the police. Spoiler alert, she doesn't really get away. Uh, Eventually, despite all of her precautionary measures, uh, there's a plot twist in New York. New officials are elected. And they're actually not corrupt. It's weird. It's like a Shyamalan twist, you know? Damn it. (laughs) Yeah. And so they said, all right, we're going to bring this this whole operation down. And um, the district attorney's office was in the midst of a cold war with a corrupt police force with boss politics. The new mayor, a guy named Edward Cooper, wanted to reform the city. He was very vocal about it. And it turned out that many people in this fair metropolis Agreed. They were like, ah, it would be nice if my stuff is stolen to at least get it back. You know? Well, yeah, exactly. But the problem is a domino effect ensued with that, at least for Marm and, and her criminal enterprise, because without the support of these politicians, she couldn't effectively bribe the officials that she needed to. And without those bribes greasing all the wheels to make stuff happen and to give her some cover, she couldn't operate out in the open anymore. Yeah, and what's more, the situation worsens because she could also no longer protect her criminal network, the city's worth of little chicks. They were once grateful for her patronage, and now they began flipping, snitching, testifying against her in court. The tide, in short, was turning. The DA, a guy named Peter Olney, hires the Pinkerton Detective Agency to take Marm's operation down once and for all. So in 1884, members of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, which, again, has its own whole very rich story um, and still exists today in (laughs) in a certain form, um, was a private entity, which in some ways kind of prevented it from being quite so open to the corruption that many public services were having issues with. Um, And they did manage to bring her reign in New York to an end. So their plan was super simple. This is the thing. Like the criminal mastermind (laughs) always gets taken down by just the stupidest, easiest thing. They got a, a bolt of silk. They tagged it. So they knew that one was the stolen one, and then they just waited for Marm to buy it, which she, of course, did. Uh, So then she was caught red-handed, and she went to trial. She was released on bail, 
This was largely thanks to the work of Howe and Hummel Law Firm. She kept them on a five thousand dollar a year retainer. Yeah, they were like the they were like the Saul Goodman of their day, 100%. right? This yes. was very Breaking Bad. It was a better call, Howe and Hummel. <laughs> <laughs> I would actually watch that show. Um, and then in a. a This rare and sort of delightfully pearl-clutching statement, very out of character, that she made to the public, Marm vehemently professed her innocence. Oh, oh, yes. Oh, this is great. I keep a dry goods store and have for 20 years past. I buy and sell dry goods, as other dry goods people do. Dry goods, you say? (laughs) I have never knowingly bought stolen goods, and neither did my son Julius. I have never stolen anything in my life. Which was probably true. I feel that these charges are brought against me in spite I have never bribed the police, nor had their protection. I never needed their protection, because I and my son are innocent of these charges, so help me God. It's going to be an amazing juxtaposition to another statement she makes a little later in the episode. (laughs) Yeah, in Um, short, Marm won Best Dramatic Performance in a non-acting role. (laughs) Absolutely, but it's really important. We haven't really mentioned this specifically, but like her whole like stroke of genius was that she never really handled the stolen goods. Mm -hmm. She just had people do it for her. So she probably maybe even like was drinking her own Kool-Aid and believed that she actually wasn't a criminal, (laughs) that she was just a proprietor, was like, you know, facilitating things, you know. I'm helping the community. I'm helping the community, exactly. She actually was, kind of. Yeah. Yeah. No one wants to be a housekeeper, right? Right. Uh, Certainly not me. Um, I did have that job once, but that's another story. So uh, rather than surrender in the midst of all of this, she decided that she would run and she escaped north to Canada and she established herself with over $1 million worth of stolen diamonds and cold hard cash. Ooh, slight backtrack. It's an amazing story how she actually accomplished this. She um, was under house arrest, essentially, or she you know, posted that bail that we talked about, and she had a housekeeper that she had impersonate her by dressing in her uh, classic outfit that she wore, which kind of was like a Queen Victoria kind of situation mm-hmm. with like a feathered hat and like a veil. So she was able to make uh, trips to her lawyer's office while the Pickertons were surveilling her, and she went into the lawyer, and then the housekeeper came out and said, they tracked the housekeeper, and then Marm made that Canadian getaway. Yeah, made a run for the border. Um, so there in Canada, they stayed purposely at second-rate, inconspicuous places. They went to a, a little hotel near the Grand Trunk Railway Station in Hamilton, Canada, and they just wanted to stay on the DL. They just tried to keep a low profile. But then on December 9th of 1884, Hamilton police and detectives arrested Marm and her two associates, uh, Julius, her son, and Herman, as they were sitting down for breakfast. So they were having omelets and handcuffs. Um, <laughs> and naturally, Marm attempted to bribe the police because that's that's her jam. Um, it worked before. Why would we not do it again? But Canadian police... They don't play. They were not having this. The (laughs) incorruptible Canadians. It's true. Uh, And so Marm was arrested yet again in Canada for possession of $4,000 worth of stolen diamonds. Wait, what? Yeah. I I don't know. Like, what would that translate to in today's money? $4,000 in diamonds? That's like a million bucks. I don't know. I'm I'm not imagining a a human handful of diamonds. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess it would be about a a fistful of diamonds. I think we can agree that loose diamonds are just inherently a sketchy thing to have. It's also absurdly baller. If you're just dealing in loose diamonds, just yeah. have them lying around. There's it's, a Jeffrey Epstein thing there. That let's we not even get into that. Let's leave that path behind. Too, too, okay, too sure. <laughs> so yeah, she's arrested again. Uh, but luckily, the owner of the diamonds couldn't like eyeball identify that the diamonds were mine. I don't know how. How would you like know that they were these were my diamonds? Maybe, I like the, how you look cut. at me. Like I just yeah. have you, all the diamonds. I mean, you're the one wearing the eye glitter, them. Holly. I, I, I own you know. zero diamonds. I don't believe in okay, them. Okay, well that's fair. Maybe maybe there was an etching on the bottom, or maybe there were specific weight or A specific cut, perhaps, sure. but this guy could not do that thing. So the Canadian cops had to let her go as well, and the New York DA didn't have jurisdiction. So he uh, wasn't able to send anyone to the Canadian court to fetch her, and Marm and her associates once again ran free. Yeah, yeah, and uh, she actually ended up with her diamonds, right? 
She totally did. She retrieved her diamonds, which is absurdly baller the second time around. I and love the idea of the jail checkout where they just hand her a here's pile your stuff of loose back. diamonds. They can't figure out who they belong to, so they must be yours. Oh, she did have to pay 640 bucks. Though. It's like the processing yeah, fee or whatever. Yeah, everybody yeah. gets a bribe, I For guess. sure. Um, so she used those diamonds. She bought herself a tiny, a small, very meager two-story house along Hamilton's Main Street. And by 1886, she'd opened you guessed it again, another dry goods store. Oh, heavens. I know. She's really good at the dry goods. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it, and it became a family operation, right? It totally, again, her three children joined her, Annie and Julius, permanently, and then her married daughter, Sarah, uh, stayed in Hamilton behind for a time before returning back to New York with her family. And so now we're at this, this strange sort of crossroads, right? We have to ask ourselves, was Marm finally, after all these years, on the straight and narrow? Were her queen pin days behind her? We're very proud of that phrase. Yeah, queen uh, pin's pretty good. <laughs> it depends on what you think, and we want to hear your opinion on this, on what you think about this letter that she sent to her friends in New York after she had started her dry goods store in Canada. I like how Ben sets this up like there will be question marks in your head, but when you hear this, there won't. Uh, <laughs> Marm wrote, quote, I beg to announce to you that I have opened my new emporium in every respect, the equal of my late New York establishment. I shall be pleased to continue our former pleasant business relations, promising not alone to pay the best prices for the article which you may have for sale, but also in carefully protecting all my customers, Mm. no matter at what expense. With my present facilities, I am able to dispose of all commodities forwarded to me with dispatch and security, trusting to hear from you soon and assuring you that a renewal of past favors will be greatly appreciated. I am yours faithfully, F. Mandelbaum. Can we unpack some of this kind of dated language real quick? So uh, I'm sorry. With I my, don't even know that it's dated. Well, it's okay, the most listen. thinly veiled letter right. of all time. Exactly. But with my present facilities, I am able to dispose of all commodities forwarded to me with dispatch and security. So I'm going to move your stolen stuff. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. continue doing what I used you to do. You guys, it's still totally cool. I'm just doing it yeah. somewhere mm-hmm. else. Exactly. If it was written in 2019, mm-hmm. it would have just said, I'm back at it. See you. Come get me. Do it. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, and it's true. Like dispatch and security. I'll not only move all your stuff, but I'll move it faster than anyone else. Yep. And you will not get busted as you would if you went to other uh, less reputable fencing establishments. Exactly. There you go. So a gentleman from New York, a reporter, headed on up to Canada. Just to, you know, peek in the store, see what's going on Check in there. Check it out. Uh, <laughs> again, it's completely legit, he said sarcastically. And uh, this guy reacted in, in a way that can only be described as faint surprise when he found that all of the new Canadian store's merchandise came from New York City. That's weird. Uh, everything was being sold at incredibly, almost unbelievably low prices. And there were absolutely zero identifying labels on any of the merchandise. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. It checks out, basically. (laughs) So it appeared that Marm was, you know, you'd think she's set up in this new place. Whatever she's doing, bribing whoever she's got to bribe, whatever she's doing to continue this business, it seems like she was ready to start anew, basically. Uh, A new chapter for her. She's going to live life out as all the stories would want us to believe, happily ever after. But unfortunately... um, it wasn't going to work out that way for her. Um, this is a, a little bit sad here. Uh, her daughter, Annie, we were, we were talking about how she was up there in Canada with her. Well, she went back to New York, as we mentioned. And while she was there, she got pretty sick and she ended up developing pneumonia. And then on November 10th, 1885, her daughter, Annie, died. And there was no way that Marm was going to not go back and uh, be there you know, for her daughter's burial. Um, and whatever the cost might be, whether it was to her livelihood, to her own personal freedom, she was going to do whatever it took. Because like we talked about earlier in the show, her children were her first and foremost priority. She was going to be there for them come hell or high water. And so Mom's, uh, Mar- Marm's former home was now owned by a Mrs. Marks. Uh, and Marm and her son Julius actually slipped into the house 
Um, and they were, and, and Marm was overcome by grief, and she fainted at the time. And she obviously had reestablished some of those old connections and those old friendships because she had a group of friends who actually were there for her and escorted her out of the house, and they hid her in a different home across the street while she recovered. Um, but while it was clear that giving Annie a Christian burial would help kind of like make things a little more low key and under the radar. Marm insisted that it had to be a traditional Jewish service in accordance with her faith. Cause like we said, she was very, very religious and there was no other way that it was going to work for her. So Marm's son, Julius tried to do a little disguise work. He shaved his hair and beard so that he would evade the police. But Marm, we mentioned she was a very tall woman and very large. She was imposing. So you couldn't really costume that situation and make her not look like herself. Uh, and she was grieving very deeply. So she probably wasn't really into the costume idea to begin with. Um, and what's really interesting is that her street family, like her criminal family, came to her daughter's funeral as well. So it was like burglars and bank thieves and pickpockets and basically every kind of person she had ever touched in her life and in her school, et cetera. And they all came out publicly. I mean, everybody at this point is taking a big risk, but they wanted to pay their respects to her daughter. And afterwards, uh, Marm went back to Hamilton, Canada. She was not apprehended by police. Uh, and the Pinkertons also left her alone. And it's unclear still if the cops took pity on a grieving mother. Uh, what we do know for sure is that sh uh, she did return uh, and that there was a police officer even stationed at the funeral. And so they knew she was there and reporters were even there to interview her that day. So it was not a secret at all. But they all just let her leave in peace after the service was over. Mm -hmm. And can I make one yeah, really point? I, to me, this just rings true of uh, that sentiment that has occurred, and in, in it, it's occurred in the past several times, and you kind of feel it in waves. And I say this as uh, an Atlantan, but that idea that we're all New Yorkers, right? Of like they know that all of these criminals are gathered in this one place, but they also know that she and these other people are important in some way uh, as a, a whole as a community as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. So they just kind of let it slide. And I think it speaks to the city well, in, in itself. There's also like almost like a rules of engagement kind of situation sure. where it's like, this is not fair game. It's like you don't arrest somebody when they're going to church. You know, like right. you, that's sort of like an unspoken rule even between law enforcement and criminals. It would seem extraordinarily cruel to arrest mm. someone at their daughter's funeral. Yeah. yeah, I have a theory as well that I think is pretty plausible. Uh, odds are, statistically, that police officer at some point worked with or for yeah. Marm. You yeah. know what I mean? So yeah. he may have been grieving uh, just as much. But from that point on, Marm becomes a successful, active pillar of the community in Hamilton, Canada. Her shop is legit, by which I mean no one officially reported a crime. That's That was good enough for her. Uh, she regularly attended the local synagogue, and she began to use that as a networking hub. She, you know, seems dead set to become a Canadian resident. However, that does not mean that New York City has forgotten about her. As a matter of fact, quite the opposite. She becomes sort of a celebrity icon of her day. She's like Elvis Presley. She's like Bigfoot. Everybody is seeing this lady in New York, and they are convinced that it's her. But regardless of how many times they see her, they describe her and so on, and they're like this close to maybe trying to get a picture of her or something, they never, they never catch her. It, it's almost like the fame of who she had become had arrested the city and people wanted to have their own Marm Mandelbaum story. And eventually uh, she passed away. And at the time, uh, her her obituaries, which were published, made international news, and they were not vilifying her really. There was even at the um, even from the law enforcement community, there was a sense of begrudging respect. They referred to her as old mother, Marm, the queen of fences. And in February of 1894, uh, when she passed away, contemporary accounts described her death as due to something called Bright's disease. Nowadays, we recognize that as nephritis or kidney disease. Uh, and her body was actually returned to New York. However, there was a mystery afoot. Well, yeah. If you're, you're someone with the influence and intelligence of Mar Mandelbaum and you wanted to get back to New York, maybe you could arrange to have it look like you died and then maybe send your body 
your body in a coffin to New York, right? But maybe it's just stones. Maybe it's actually stolen goods that are in that coffin. That'd be pretty cool. Uh, who, who knows? I'm, and her legend, of course, feeds all of these, you know, thoughts that people were having. They were wondering, was it possible that she's still alive and living in Ontario? And was she, as some cor- sources claimed, calling herself an entirely new thing, reinventing herself as Madame Fuchs, and then kind of plotting a covert return to the Lower East Side? Yeah, but perhaps maybe the better question is, do legends ever truly pass away? And to quote the, the, you know, the, the wonderful Neil Young, it's better to burn out than to fade away. You know, <laughs> there it's you true. go. Man. And that's it's exactly a... what, what Mandelbaum did. It's, you know? it's a good question because we know that while Mar may no longer be with us today, her legacy does remain. She was the most successful fence. She was the first mob boss of this country. And history at its heart is a palimpsest. You know, whatever occurs or is written today will never fully erase the past. It's so true. So the next time you're walking around in this area, if you just happen to make it over here and you walk past 79 Clinton Street, just take a second. Just stand there for a second, knowing the history, because there's a pawn shop right there mm-hmm. in that location now. A pawn shop. Mm-hmm. Kind of crazy, right? There's a sign, a big, bold yellow sign with bright red letters that says, We buy gold, silver, Diamonds and any other Horses? dry goods. Carriages? Oh, no, I'm just no, kidding. He no, doesn't no. have that part. <laughs> but it does say we do repairs, though. Of mm-hmm. course they do. Uh, you can also actually find her burial site um, at the Union Field Cemetery at Congregation Rodef Shalom, which is in Queens today. And so maybe we end on some other questions. Was Frederica Marm Mandelbaum a criminal? I mean, yes. Yes, that, that one's pretty easy to answer. But was she a bad person? That depends on who you're asking. And it's also, although it's tempting to oversimplify people and to put them in the box of good or bad, you know, diabolical or saint-like, it's unfair to them. And like any other person, Marm was much more complex than a pat answer, you know? Yep. And thank you so much for joining us, Holly. Oh, my great pleasure. I I have to ask, I know everybody's wondering if you're not familiar yet, uh, for for our fellow history buffs in the audience, where can they learn more about stuff you missed in history class? Uh, We are everywhere on social media as Missed in History. You can also go to MissedInHistory.com and find all of our episodes of all time uh, going back many years. Uh, And any of the the episodes since Tracy and I have been on the show, which has been since twenty. 13, 13? Uh, we'll have show notes attached to them. So come and visit. We would love to meet you. And if you want to check out more stuff they don't want you to know, you can do that by going to your podcast platform of choice and look up uh, stuff they don't want you to know. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter and all that stuff is Conspiracy Stuff Show. Conspiracy Stuff or Conspiracy Stuff Yeah, show. one or the other. Just, 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 just keep typing. Yeah. Uh, I, before we wrap up entirely, though, I, I have yeah, a quick sure. question. One thing I noticed when we were researching this is there's not a lot of like evidence in the writings and the, the um, history of Mara Mandelbaum about her being some kind of ruthless, murderous person. No. There's yeah. really she very little violence in her story. Well, well, here's the thing. When you're operating a criminal enterprise like that, how how are you going to prove a lot of the things that happen in the basements of you know theaters before they get excavated, right? <laughs> I mean, I good mean, question, yeah. Like, really, how do you prove that stuff unless you get caught red-handed or somebody uh, uh, leaks that information to the authorities or something like that? Or a bribe Who, arrives late. Well, exactly. How do we really know what was happening Right. With her enterprise. But her MO definitely does seem to have been kind of more of a kill him with kindness. Like, I will win everyone over. Right. Because she, she was, was a diplomat. I for think sure. even the people, and uh, the situation with her daughter's funeral is even evidence that even the people who were uh, positioned against her mm-hmm. in terms of the battle of legalities still kind of loved her. Yeah. yeah, you have to, I mean, you have to respect someone, even if, they're, if you're diametrically opposed, because. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead. Maybe it's speculation, but like you said, Holly, everything about her proves that she didn't get her hands dirty, and she would probably say that murder is bad for business when you think about it, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, again, thank you guys so much for having thank me. You I'm guys so for coming. Yeah. Thank awesome. you guys for coming. Thanks to Warner Brothers. Uh, please check out the kitchen if you'd like to hear more stories about similarly badass women. Right? Yeah. It's it comes coming out on up Friday, August 9th. Mm-hmm. I'm giving thumbs up to everybody who's in the audience. <laughs> and thanks so much. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, we guys. hope you enjoy the theater. The uh, the Gangster Museum is upstairs, by the way, if you ever in town and want to check that out. Yes. All spectacular. Right, guys. See you soon. Bye. Thank, Thank you so much, Bye. everybody. Thank you.
Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.